Can everybody see this PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. Is it is it blown up full size? It is, but the notes are on the side. Aha. Uh -huh. Let me see if I can make that disappear. Is that better? Uh, yes. No, it's okay. good. Okay. So first and foremost, if I go too quickly, just let me know and I can, of course, slow down. Um, so as Lakeisha said, my name's Olivia. I am a licensed speech language pathologist and I'm working currently in the state of New Jersey. Um, we work both at the acute care hospital for Valley Hospital in Ridgewood and also at our outpatient facility, which is where I was treating and working with Trish. So today's presentation is just to give some background information and some um, information about what cognitive therapy looks like, um, especially in the setting of somebody that, that has normal pressure hydrocephalus. So there are various diagnoses that can result in a cognitive impairment. Some of those include Parkinson's disease, uh, patients that have dementia, multiple sclerosis, a traumatic brain injury, normal pressure hydrocephalus. There's other ones, but those are some of the primary uh, diagnoses that we work with. The goal of our cognitive therapy is to try to provide education and training and instruction regarding compensatory strategies that will help to facilitate functional day-to-day -day activities and or return to work, depending on the age of our patients, depending on the goals of our patients, to try to get them back to as functional of a status as we possibly can. So even though Trish said that she felt smarter every time she left cognitive therapy, we're not necessarily making you smarter, but our goal is to get you to a point of functionality where you can continue or get back to enjoying the things that you used to do before your cognitive impairment became an issue. So cognitive therapy can be beneficial for a variety of reasons and every patient is different. So our therapy is tailored to try to be as individualized as possible, depending on that specific patient that we're working with. So some of the deficits that we treat include patients that may have memory impairments and that can include um, forgetting recent events, patients that might ask the same question you know, every five minutes, patients that may have difficulty remembering appointments, we work on trying to help patients that might have difficulty with their attention or their focus. So maybe they lose attention quickly or maybe they're easily distractible. We work with patients that have difficulty with planning and organization. So people that might have difficulty planning out their day, they might have difficulty sequencing activities, they might have difficulty completing a task like managing a checkbook, for example. Um, we also work with patients that have difficulty with problem solving or reasoning skills. So uh, oftentimes we're working with patients to ensure that their safety awareness is okay, whether it's in the hospital or um, whether if, if you're working with a therapist in a inpatient rehab facility or if the plan is to get back home, making sure that your safety awareness is as strong as possible. We work with patients that have difficulty with processing. So this could be trouble um, with understanding things that you're reading or understanding when people are speaking to you. We work with patients that have difficulty with language or um, thinking or coming up with the desired word that they're trying to say. And we work with patients that have difficulty with complex decision making. So again, this could be something along the lines of um, helping you with uh, medical management or remembering to take your medicine, helping with finances in the home and paying bills or managing a checkbook. So there's a wide variety of um, difficulties that a patient may present with that we try to tailor as best we can to meet the needs of that patient. Olivia, can I jump in there? Sure. One of the things that I learned from Olivia is that things that I was, problems I was attributing to memory impairment were really attention deficits. And when we worked on improving my attention, what I thought was my memory problems did get better. One of the things I really struggled with was divided attention, where I was trying to do two things at once. And my job used to require me to do five things at once. And that was a struggle. So just, I, I really benefited from attention um, therapy and working on uh, games and puzzles that, that stress that attention. 
And that's a good point. Just um, just because these are some impairments that are listed sort of separately doesn't mean that a patient might have difficulty with more than one of these impairments. Or like Trish was explaining, there might be, you might think you have trouble with one thing, but there's actually a, an underlying issue that may be more of the problem. So part of the evaluation that you would do with the therapist and part of the therapy would be to sort of tease out where exactly your deficits are and, and what's going to be the most helpful for you to focus on. So um, the suggestion is that as soon as you become aware of any sort of cognitive decline or any sort of thinking or um, problem solving skills that you may notice, you should seek help from your physician. Um, this could include your primary care doctor, if you're being followed by a neurologist or if you're being followed by a neurosurgeon, any of them can really help you to start this process. Um, once they're aware, they can provide you with a prescription for a cognitive evaluation, and that would be what sort of begins the ultimate therapy process. Um, the one piece is that the cognitive therapy is usually most successful when it's coupled with medical management. So in the case of normal pressure hydrocephalus, it's typically the shunt placement because these deficits usually won't resolve until that fluid that's on the brain is managed. Um, our goal is obviously to you know, see some sort of improvement. And sometimes you see that improvement just from the shunt placement in and of itself. Um, but the hope is that in addition to that and coupled with cognitive therapy, you continue to see improvement each and every week. Um, I, I can speak just from some of the patients that we see at our facility now that sometimes the physicians aren't quite aware of cognitive therapy. So um, the second that you notice any sort of decline, bringing it up to your doctor is, is you know, definitely something that's recommended. And usually the response that you get is, okay, sure, here's a prescription. Um, they're not always the first to suggest the physical therapy or the cognitive therapy. So it's just something good for you to know that you can, you can help to start that process. That's exactly what happened with me, Olivia. I did a whole lot of uh, work on physical therapy to get my walking back, which was atrocious. But after a couple months, the, the neurosurgeon said, okay, I don't have to see you for a while. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I still can't think. I still can't remember things. And then he said, oh, we should get you some cognitive therapy. So that was a perfect um, example of, of what Olivia was talking about. Okay, so some of the compensatory strategies that we utilize to try to help with any sort of cognitive deficits are listed here. And again, um, depending on the patient, some of these strategies may be helpful, some of these strategies may not be helpful. Um, and depending on the patient, sometimes a conjunction of multiple strategies may be what's most successful. So that therapy process is very much sort of reassessing and working you know, with your therapist to find out what works best for you. So I listed a couple examples of compensatory strategies. Um, visual imagery will allow you to um, sort of coach you to picture something in your head so that later on down the road, you can sort of go back to that mental in image in your head to help you to recall some information. Um, writing is exactly what it sounds like, you know, keeping a notebook, uh, making lists, using a calendar, for example. Word chaining or association is trying to find ways that um, either different words are associated together or different um, scenarios or uh, appointments that you might need to remember, how can you associate them together to make it a little bit easier? Um, this could be something that is oftentimes helpful for patients that need to make a grocery list, similar to what that visual imagery, you're, you're sitting at your kitchen table and you're thinking about everything that you need to get from the grocery store. So you sort of picture the store in your mind and you go up and down the aisles, okay, I need fruit, I need bread. And then that helps you to recall some of the things that you might need to remember. Um, chunking is a strategy where you try to clump different pieces of information together to make smaller clumps. So the best example of this would be a phone number. Our, our working memory can really only hold a finite amount of information, but if we can sort of chunk, then our brain looks at it as smaller pieces of information to have to remember. So a phone number that might be 10 digits is a lot to hold on to, but we sort of chunk it by 201, 848, 1547. So our, our brain only thinks of three pieces of information as opposed to a long string of 10 digits. 
immediate rehearsal is, is sort of just repeating that repetition back in your head. You know, if you if you're remembering two things that you need to add to your grocery list, you might say to yourself over and over again, okay, I need eggs and milk, eggs and milk, eggs and milk. And then an external strategy um, would be something like I had mentioned, uh, using a calendar to help to keep your appointments in order, using cell phones now is a big external strategy that a lot of patients will use to set alarms for themselves or to add appointments into a calendar. So there's many different ways that we can try to help to give you ideas to make you as functional as possible. Okay, so I tried to give some examples of some therapy activities that we might work on so that you have a little bit more of a sense of what therapy might actually look like. So a picture recall task would be one of them. And I think in the slides moving forward, um, I give examples of all of these. So they'll be a little bit um, less abstract as we move through. Picture recall is one of them. Auditory comprehension or your ability to listen to something and answer questions. We can do that with or without the use of taking notes. Same thing with reading comprehension, your ability to read something, remember it and answer questions with or without taking notes. Um, we can work on activities that focus on math. So we sometimes have patients that were accountants or they worked in the finance world and they wanna get better at you know, getting back to some of their functional math tasks that they need to do. Um, Trish talked a little bit about attention to detail or alternating or sustaining your attention and not losing focus. Uh, she talked a little bit about some deduction puzzles to try to really tax the system to get you to feel more comfortable with some higher level activities. Uh, we talked about safety awareness and being able to solve problems. And there's some other games that you can target and work on for the purposes of organizational thought and keeping your, your thought process and your mindset as organized as possible. So this is an example of what a word association worksheet might look like. So you can see up at the top, kangaroo, flea, and frog. They're all sort of random words that you might have to remember. But if you can make some sort of association like things that hop, your brain starts to think about this things that hop. And that's sort of the, the key word or the reminder for yourself later on to remember these three things that might hop. So again, you're focusing on thinking about one key word that helps you to trigger your memory of three other pieces of information. This is a worksheet that explains or gives examples of what word chaining might look like. So this too is similar to association where you're trying to find a way that you can get all of these words to have some sort of a meaning together so that later on down the road, if you think of one word, it helps to sort of spark your memory of the others. So for example, um, you might put a little scenario together and say, you know, I want a cold glass of milk with dinner. Or um, this one here, number this uh, column that has five words in it. Um, I'm gonna go to the movie theater, but first I have to park the car. Then I can buy a ticket and popcorn and sit down in front of the screen. So if you sort of can find ways to associate or to chain words together, it helps you to be able to better recall them as opposed to looking at them as just four or five random words. This is an example of chunking. So again, we talked about the example of a telephone number, but you know, trying to find categories instead of looking at these six random words that you might have up here, they broke or they chunked these words into things that cut and things that stick. So now your brain sort of looks at just these two pieces of information and it helps to spark your memory to remember the six words that you might have to recall. So this could also be something that you use at the grocery store. Maybe you break things down between produce and frozen food. And then you can sort of clump whatever would be in the produce aisle with whatever might be in the frozen food section. This is another form of association. We often have patients that come and tell us that they can't remember the names of people. Now, again, if you were somebody that could never remember the name of somebody, I don't know that I'm going to fix that, but if you were somebody that used to be good with names and faces, then there's some ways to try to target that. So um, you're, you're looking at somebody's face or you're looking at a, a person that you just meet at a dinner party and you wanna be able to remember their name in 10 minutes, try to, find some way that you can associate their name with maybe something they're wearing. So this gentleman on the bottom right, his name is Carl and he's wearing a cap. 
So you think about the C for Carl, you think about the C for Cap, and when you see him in 10 minutes, you'll remember, okay, the Cap, oh, his name was Carl. So there's different ways that we can try to help you to be able to find pieces of information that will be successful in helping you to come up with whatever it is you're trying to remember. This is what we call a picture scene recall. So we can work on giving patients, and depending on the difficulty that you're having, you can start with very simple pictures, and then you can increase the complexity to a picture like this, where there's obviously a lot of detail, there's a lot that's going on in the picture, and we give our patients a couple minutes to look at the picture. We have them talk through everything that they see to make sure that they're picking up on the detail. And then we cruelly take the picture out of your site. And then we might ask you questions such as, how many people did you see in the picture? What library rule are the young children disobeying? And from that mental image, you would need to say, okay, there was two people at the table, two kids running in the background and a librarian. There were five people total. And each week that you work on this and, and that motor planning and that motor memory gets stronger and stronger, that visual imagery helps you to be able to go back and say, okay, I remember, I remember there was a picture on the back wall. I think it was of a plant. And I don't know, I think maybe Trish can speak to, even though it seems abstract now, the more that you practice it and the more that you get comfortable with these, with these strategies, you start to surprise yourself how much you actually can remember. I know, and you get better at trying to figure out what Olivia is going to ask you. <laughs> how we're going to trick you. We, we did this picture and I remember saying, I bet you she's going to ask me about the calendar. And guess what? <laughs> she did. Yeah. So, yeah. You do get a little bit better at anticipating what, what the questions will be. And it helps you too, you know, going back to Trisha's comment about focus and, and attention to detail. You know, sometimes we're just concerned at, at the bigger picture and you don't realize, you know, the first time I show this picture to people and I ask them what month it is, they tell me you couldn't tell from the picture. And then when I put it back in front of them, they say, oh, I didn't even realize that there was a calendar in the background. So just sort of making patients more aware of these details helps them to be able to focus and helps them to be able to be more successful in their everyday activities. Okay, this is an example of an activity that we could work on in therapy that would help with either auditory or reading comprehension. So if I showed somebody um, this newspaper article or this advertisement, it would be more of the reading comprehension where they would be looking at it, they would be reading to themselves or reading out loud, and then I might ask them some questions about the information that they read. Or the other way around is I could read it out loud to them, they wouldn't necessarily see the article, and then I would ask them some questions about it. Again, these are just examples of materials that we have, but at least for myself, I try to make it as functional and as individualized as possible. So if I know somebody loves to read the newspaper and they love to read the sports every single morning, I'll have them bring the newspaper into therapy and we'll focus on the sports page and me and I can turn uh, an auditory or reading comprehension task into something that's more functional, something that the patient enjoys more. And I think it's a little bit more salient and a little bit um, a way to keep patients a little bit more engaged in the therapy process. So this is an example of if we just increase the complexity, again, when you start with therapy, you may be having significant difficulties where you have to start with a task that's a little bit simpler, but as you progress and as things start to get easier for you, the job of the clinician is gonna to be to keep challenging you. So we make those activities more difficult even though they're targeting the same area that you're having trouble with. So you can see that this is still an auditory or a reading comprehension task, but now there's a lot more detail. It's about a paragraph. So somebody that maybe is a, a teacher, you know, might start with something like this or might have to do things that are a little bit more um, literature based. So there's, there's many different types of activities to target the same area that you're having trouble with. Um, this is another example where again, um, through use of reading comprehension, patients will be given a calendar or they might be given, let's say, a, um, a picture of a medicine label. 
And then there'll be questions that have to do with that calendar that have to do with that medicine bottle to make sure that you can sort of read and comprehend and understand what you are reading to be able to successfully answer the questions. So this is one of my favorite parts of cognitive therapy. It's where we talk more about um, some puzzles. This is a deduction puzzle where they'll give you some clues and they'll give you some hints. And some of them are extremely helpful. Some of the clues you have to sort of infer from, but this is a, a simpler sort of activity where um, you see four pictures of houses up here and you see two clues down here. So their house does not have a chimney. So you know that the house that they're looking for can't be number three because there's a chimney and it can't be number four because there's a chimney. So it leaves number one and number two open. And the second clue tells us that their house is not two stories. So we know it can't be house number one, which means that the only house that's left is house number two. So again, depending on the patient, depending on how difficult of a time they're having with any sort of problem solving, we can start simple. And then there's some examples of, again, another deduction puzzle that's a little bit more complex. They give you two, they give you two clues up here and you have to fill in these boxes to find out which person plays which position based off of the information that they give you. And to take it even further, you can get to deduction puzzles that are much more detailed. So these 15 clues are all supposed to be helpful for you to find out what sort of dog, what type of collar and what city all of these people relate to. So again, it's a, it's a fun activity because I think patients look at it more so as a game than really sort of homework or work. Um, and it's a, it's a way that the clinician is, is sort of put on the spot to really have to challenge their patients. Okay, picture incongruities. This is just, again, another example of, of a worksheet that we can be working on in therapy. Um, so you have to sort of problem solve and reason, you know, what do you see that's wrong with these pictures? So for example, this first one, um, I don't know that you're RSVPing to a tombstone, maybe an RIP. Um, if you notice down here, the, the patient was actually actually died before they were born. So that can actually be correct. Um, in this veterinary clinic picture, you see that there's no dogs or cats allowed. Well, that can't be right if it's a vet clinic. So it helps us to get a, a sense of um, the thinking skills that our patients have and how well they can sort of problem solve and reason. These are also uh, worksheets that we can be working on not only in therapy, but I'm a big fan of uh, sending patients home with homework. Sorry, Trish. So these, uh, these worksheets can, can double both as activities that we work on in the therapy session. And then I like to supplement and have the patients go home with similar worksheets to, to sort of help to carry over what they learned with me into their own home environment. Can I jump in, Olivia? Sure. One of the forms of homework I did was um, go home and read an article from the newspaper and then turn it over and write down as many things as I could remember from the article. So my husband got involved, he'd find me a good article, he'd print it out, I would read it and then turn it over. And at first I, you know, I'd only come up with four or five or six points. After I did this a bunch of times, I was up to 18, 19, 20 and feeling, you know, like I had a handle on it. It was, it was a good exercise. Yep. So again, depending on um, the, the, the hobbies of our patients or their, what they find to be exciting, we try to tailor not only therapy, but also the, um, the homework to, you know, whatever they're going to think is, is most functional. So I have a patient right now that I'm actually seeing for COG therapy that has always been a big reader. I mean, she could read a book, an entire book on an airplane. That was her big thing. And, and ever since her um, her accident, she hasn't been able to read. So that's been like one of the biggest challenges and something that has been a goal for herself. So instead of working on worksheets like this, I actually have her bring her, she, she has, she had a book that she wanted to read, but she wasn't, she didn't have the confidence to start. So we incorporated that book into her therapy sessions initially when she would come to see me and, um, every week for homework, her homework was to complete, you know, at least one, 
chapter in the book and she would have to come, you know, she would have some sort of activity that dealt with the chapter that she was reading. And, and I find that you get a much better response from patients when you can sort of um, send them home with something that they enjoy doing. Usually they are the ones that come back with their homework completed. Okay, we talked about how patients might have difficulty with math or money computation. So again, some of our patients come in and they say, you know, I used to be able to do mental math without even having to think about it. Now I can't add two numbers together. So, um, you know, doing worksheets that might start simple like something like this or incorporating actual money or paper money on this worksheet to try to help, you know, patients will have goals of, I wanna be able to leave the tip at a restaurant, or I wanna be able to give the exact change when I pay for something at the store. So we, again, will tailor that therapy session to have them ultimately meet their goal. You know, we've had some patients that we've walked next door to the, the Quickie Mart and they've been able to actually, you know, pay for their bottle of soda and not have to use a calculator and be able to, to count the change and count the money on their own. So as, as functional as we can make it, where you can actually start to see the, the progress of your therapy in, in real time is our ultimate goal. Um, we talked a little bit about sequencing and how having to plan out your day or sequence out an activity might be something that's difficult. So again, this is an example of a worksheet that we can work on, but there's also been patients that we've worked, um, you know, taking them into the kitchen and can they sequence the steps to uh, bake a cookie or can they sequence the steps down in the PT gym to complete one of the exercises that they work on with the physical therapists, but they wanna be more independent and in being able to go through the sequences themselves. We're fortunate in the facility that I work at now that our physical, occupational, and uh, speech therapy are all on the same floor, all in the same hallway. So we share a lot of patients um, and we can do a lot of that sort of interdisciplinary uh, training if we need to, where we can touch base with the physical therapist and say, hey, what are you guys working on? I wanna try to incorporate it into my COG therapy so that the patients sort of get a mixture of both. Um, we talked a little bit about safety awareness. So again, um, where I am right now in terms of outpatient, these patients are obviously all living at home, but we wanna make sure that we can target some uh, questions or at least be able to provide them some scenarios so that we can see where their thought process might be in terms of, do we feel comfortable enough for them to be able to take medicine by themselves and not have to have a family member or a spouse help them? Do we feel comfortable that they can in fact, you know, use the stove and, and remember to turn it off, you know, unassisted, things like that. So oftentimes the safety awareness piece comes into play with um, caregiver training as well. So as best we can, we also try to work with patient spouses or caregivers. Um, oftentimes we'll work with private aides that might be assisting the patient and the family so that the carryover from what we're working on in therapy is actually happening in the home environment. Um, we talked about those external strategies like using your cell phone. Uh, this is an example of a, of a simple calendar. So again, can you find a common place in your house where everybody goes, you know, every morning, maybe it's your refrigerator, maybe it's your kitchen table, where you can sort of go day by day or week by week to organize your life, whether it's doctor's appointments, social gatherings you might have, um, and the use of a calendar is something that we will stress to our patients. Keep in mind that a lot of these strategies are strategies that we probably all use. And it's not really until you start to have trouble that you think to yourself, you know, this is more of a crutch than anything else. But the reality of it is, you know, we were talking before this, this course started about how, you know, even myself, I have to make lists. I have to jot things down. I have to put appointments. I set an alarm so that I didn't forget about this, uh, this call. They're all strategies that we use throughout the day and we don't think much of them. It, they may just be strategies that when you start to have a cognitive impairment, you may just have to be more mindful of or um, utilize a little bit more frequently. Maria, I'd like to jump in. Sure. One of the strategies that I resisted greatly using was turning on my darn GPS. I always had a terrific memory for directions and a great sense of direction. And then you started getting lost on the way to it. One night it was a, a, a class and I came in the next morning and saw Olivia and I said, I had a meltdown last night. What happened? Well, I went to a place I know how to get to and I got lost. 
Did you do you have a GPS? Yeah. Did you have it on? No. So <laughs> Olivia convinced me. It took a little bit, but she convinced me that I should A, get it out of the glove compartment, B, put it on the dashboard, and C, turn it on every single time. And it definitely helped. Just that visual um, presentation of the streets and where I was kind of sinks in in the background, but using it when I needed to, absolutely. And Olivia said, you might have had a great memory for directions in the past, but this is now, things have changed. You have NPH, deal. And she said it more nicely than that. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked, it, it, I needed to hear that. And sometimes too, these strategies are things that um, we, we might encourage our patients to use. And if you find that in the moment, you don't have to refer to it, then you don't have to. So if you have a calendar and you know you put down that today you had this cognitive talk to sit down and, and pay attention to, and you remembered it, then you don't have to go to the calendar. But at least those those strategies and those um, those that help is there for you should you need it, almost as a safety net. And those times where you don't need to use it, you don't have to worry about it. But those times where in a pinch you can't forget something or you wanted to clarify or confirm, you have that strategy already, you know, there for you. Um, and then there's just some other cognitive enhancing activities that um, have been shown to be beneficial for patients that are having any sort of deficits. So there's a lot of um, online brain games that help to keep your, your mind working. I know Trish was a big fan of Lumosity when we were working together. Um, learning a new hobby. So uh, people that say, okay, I want to I wanna start to learn how to play the piano. I want to start to learn how to sing. Um, Sudoku or crossword puzzles that help with math or word finding and, and um, thinking skills. Creative writing or trying to write a memoir, for example. Uh, line dancing was, you know, again, sort of falls under learning a new hobby, but doing some sort of new physical activity, learning a new language. Um, I think Trish can speak to some of these. I know she's doing some things with ESL. Um, or, or even joining, you know, different uh, discussion groups or different social groups. I know in the communities now there's a lot of um, senior centers, for example, where they do all kinds of activities all throughout the year. I know it's a little, little different in these times with the pandemic, but, you know, getting yourself out and about and doing things that are not always the most routine or is giving you an opportunity to have to learn is helping for that brain to, to create new pathways and to create new connections to help with that memory and that thinking. And it can be very uncomfortable. I mean, I'm, I'm now 72. Do I want to learn something where I look like an idiot because I don't already know how to do it? Not always, but if you can find something where you have the ability to start easy in a safe environment, line dancing at the senior center before pandemic was a great example. It got me out, it got me moving. It really tested my balance. Having to turn, especially turn twice, you know, it, it was very hard um, right after shunt surgery, but I got better. And the people there kind of knew, well, Olivia and I gave a presentation there, so they definitely knew what I was dealing with. And so if you find a, a, a way to do some of these things in a not too challenging way, it's, it's a lot more. And I think it helps too to sort of give you as the patient or you even as the caregiver a little sense of um, the progress that you're making because I remember when Trish, you know, had first started dancing, she would come into therapy and tell me, you know, I'm just focusing on or, or when you went back to the gym, I'm just focusing on, you know, keeping my balance. I'm not doing anything crazy. I'm just, I'm just working on, you know, moving from side to side and not losing balance. And then as the weeks went on, it was, hey, I could do one turn. Hey, I can do two turns now. And you sort of can, can better gauge for yourself what you were able to do last month versus what you're able to do now. And it gives you a good sense of the progress that you're actually making without really noticing it. Okay, so one of the questions that we oftentimes get is how can you attend cognitive or speech therapy? I also wanted just to clarify that, again, I'm a speech pathologist by background, and that sometimes is a hindrance when you're looking for cognitive therapy, because um, depending on who you, who you get on the telephone when you're calling different facilities, if you ask for a cognitive therapist, sometimes um, they, don't, they don't know what that is. So if you're, if you're 
need any sort of clarification, it's typically a speech pathologist that is the one that is giving the cognitive evaluations and the therapy. Um, so usually you need to have a referral or a prescription from a doctor. And again, that can be your general practitioner, that can be a neurologist, uh, a neurosurgeon, anybody that can write the prescription for you. Uh, usually an APN can write them. And your physician should be able to help to sort of point you in the right direction regarding a facility where you can get therapy. However, like we said before, sometimes um, there's, there's little information given or the physician might not be sure where you can go to attend therapy. therapy. So my suggestion is always to start to, um, by reaching out to your local hospitals in the area because they typically have some sort of outpatient facility that's associated with them. And if they don't, they should know um, of some surrounding facilities that would provide outpatient rehab. And then you would give the facility a call and they would book you for an evaluation. And that's when you would meet with the speech pathologist. They would complete a formal cognitive evaluation. That's basically, you know, a boatload of questions that targets all of the areas we talked about, your planning skills, your organization, your memory. Um, and with the speech pathologist, the, you, you would sort of determine your areas of strengths and your areas of weakness. And then together you would establish a plan of care or you would establish you know, what your goals are for therapy. What are things that you wanna work on? What are things that you wish you could do better? And then depending on the results of your evaluation, you and the, the speech pathologist would schedule weekly therapy. Um, and again, depending on the patient, depending on the severity of the difficulty that they're having, that might be one time a week, that might be a recommendation for two to three times a week. And like I said before, the, the therapy process is sort of an ongoing reevaluation. So they might start you off with twice a week. And as you continue to make progress, they might only they might drop you down to have to only come once a week. So you'll, you'll work continuously with the therapist to determine what's going to be best practice for you. And like I said, in addition to the weekly therapy, um, I strongly suggest that if you're not given, that you ask for homework. And again, this could be something where it's like a worksheet that we print out and have you do, or it can be something that's a little bit more functional. So you know, Trish gave the example of, well, I read the newspaper anyway. So we turned that into a memory task where she had to read and try to recall different um, points that she remembered or patients that love to cook. You know, you might give them a recipe that they have to try to follow and can they sequence all of those steps to get cookies that come out correctly. So there's there's many different ways to structure not only the in-person therapy, but also the homework piece that goes along with it. Um, the other question we get is whether or not this is a forever process because sometimes this is, um, rightfully so, a little bit overwhelming. Sometimes there's um, a fear component or a, a depression component where patients don't really want to even get involved or start the process. So again, this isn't something where we're, we're keeping you on our list forever. Our goal is to get you as functional as possible, and our goal is to get you as independent as possible. So once we can get you to the point where you sort of know what you have to do, you have the skills to use, our goal is to discharge you with the idea that now you're gonna take everything we learned in therapy and be as functional as possible in your everyday life. Um, our job as the skilled professionals is to make sure that we're training you on the strategies and the skills so that you can be as functional as possible by yourself, with your family, with your loved ones. Um, we will do uh, family training as well, again, depending on the patient's cognitive status, depending on any other sort of comorbidities. Sometimes it's, it's a combination of treatment, not only with the patient, but also with their caregiver. And then once that level of independence is achieved, whether it's the patient themselves or the family member, then you don't necessarily require that skilled therapy anymore. Again, that doesn't mean that down the road, if you start to notice you have difficulty or if something else comes up, you can usually get another prescription from the doctor and you can usually get reevaluated and see where you are at that point. But like I said before, the, the therapy process is, is truly this ongoing conversation and reassessment with the therapist and the patient and the family to try to achieve you know, the goals that you have come up with together as efficiently and as effectively as possible. So. We set goals from the very first evaluation, and then we're constantly changing those goals. We're constantly challenging, challenging the patient. Once something becomes too easy for them, it's our job to really sort of push them and, and get them to be, to be better and stronger. Um, and then the 
discussion about discharge is something that's that's always happening. It's never it, it should never be something where they sort of drop the bomb on you and say, okay, and today's your last session. We're always trying to have these discussions. I just had a phone call with a, a patient's wife literally before this phone call, uh, before this co conference call, um, just to let her know what my plan is, what I saw during the last reevaluation. And the goal is, you know, he's going to come for two more sessions. And at that point, we're going to discharge him home with a whole packet to keep working on. So that's also sort of an ongoing discussion, even from the start of therapy, to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, and then this last point about progress is greatly dependent on the motivation of the patient themselves. Um, just like anything else, if, if we can tailor the therapy to be as specific to the patient and really focus on things that they enjoy, we get a much, much better response and we typically see much better progress. Um, again, I think there's a component that, that comes along with anytime patients have difficulty with their communication or their thinking skills that can um, make it a challenge for them to really want to start this process. And, you know, although that's not, you know, we're, we're not psychologists in this, it, there's definitely that ongoing conversation and communication to keep patients motivated and, and to be able to show them, you know, the progress that they are making and, and the reasons why we're working on the activities that we're working on. Um, so for those of you that are located in the New Jersey or New York uh, area, this is just a, a picture of our outpatient facility. And just to give you an idea, if you are looking for uh, facilities in your area, typically rehab is usually together and it encompasses physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. And I gave you a list of some of the things um, that speech pathologists work on. So again, it sometimes is misleading when they talk about a speech therapist. We oftentimes get the, oh, you help people talk. But if you can look here, um, you know, cognition is what we talked about today, and that can involve your memory, your attention, your thinking skills, your organization. We also work with patients that have difficulty with language. So your ability to understand uh, when people are talking or understand words, your ability to express yourself well and find the words that you want to say and be able to put them in a sentence. We work with patients that have difficulty with the clarity of their speech, so any sort of slurred speech or what they call dysarthria. We work with patients that have any sort of swallowing difficulty. This word dysphagia is just the fancy term for a swallowing impairment. So patients that need um, maybe to have certain consistencies of food because it's, it's safer for them. Um, and then we also work with patients that have any sort of voice difficulties. So if they have a hoarseness or a breathiness, um, if they've had tracheostomy tubes because of breathing difficulties, if they've had what they call a laryngectomy where they take the voice box out because of maybe something like cancer. So there's a lot of, a lot of areas that a speech pathologist works on. Cognition is just one of them. Um, but keep in mind, you know, if you are searching for things and you're not getting the most help from the physicians that a speech pathologist is the one that does in fact work on the cognition piece. I can't tell you how many times I've recommended to someone that they look for a speech pathologist and they say, but there's nothing wrong with my speech. And I said the same thing to Olivia, except maybe there's too much speech, but <laughs> nothing wrong with getting the words out. And it, it just comes with the territory. So that's the kind of professional you're looking for who will also give cognitive therapy. I think that's it. Yep. Any questions? I just wanted to say one thing that came up with that last um, PowerPoint. I don't know if anyone else deals with this, but I have problems with word finding. Like I know what I want to say, but I have trouble like bringing it up, like saying it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It doesn't happen often, but it happens in the worst moments. And that's a good point. I think sometimes too, when, when um, your emotions play a part in it and you're thinking about, you know, if it's, if it's happening in the worst time because it's a, a more stressful conversation or you have anxiety because of the person that you're speaking to, or you're sort of psyching yourself out and saying, you know, don't mess up, don't mess up. And then all of a sudden you, you blank. Yep. Um, it's definitely something that a speech pathologist can work on with you. Again, there's, there's strategies to help you to be able to sort of work around that. So if you are at a loss for a certain word, instead of just standing there and having there be silence, there's some strategies to be able to, you know, um, talk around it or find a similar word in order to keep your conversation at least moving. But it's not an uncommon 
um, difficulty that we see. Thank you, Pedro. Feel free to uh, type your question in a chat box or you can raise your hand by using the reaction icon at the bottom of your um, screen in the toolbar. Any other questions for, for Olivia? Must have questions. <laughs> exactly. And I know, Olivia, as I, I told you earlier, there was an individual that uh, wanted to know about um, very sorry that they she wanted to know her husband is uh, declining you know cognitively even after shun surgery and how can she uh, help to maintain where he's at instead of you know having more decline sure so um i think sometimes what happens is like i said before there's some other comorbidities that could be playing a factor um so it's hard for me to know this patient in particular but if it's somebody that's had other sort of neurological events before maybe a, a stroke that's already impaired the cognition or maybe has an underlying dementia diagnosis for example sometimes um there are some things that are progressive where your cognition might not necessarily improve but the goal at that point is exactly what it sounds like she's looking for how can we sort of maintain where their skills are so that they don't continue this fast you know progression or this fast decline so mm -hmm. my suggestion to that would be to still definitely seek out a speech pathologist that can do an evaluation they can um, figure out you know where the strengths and the weaknesses are figure out what the goals are with the family and the patient themselves and in that situation um, if I was a therapist it would be a lot more of caregiver education and caregiver training. So I would prefer that the spouse or the family member, whoever was most involved, was actually involved in my therapy with the patient. That way they can see what we're working on each and every week and they can help with that carryover. And part of my job would be the training of the caregiver to be able to implement strategies to keep the patient as um, focused and motivated when they're home, working on these different areas that might be uh, difficult for them. Okay. But sometimes, especially when memory is, is more of an issue too, if the patient themselves can't be the one that's doing sort of the, the directing of their own care, then it's a lot of that um, caregiver involvement or that family training. Okay, thank you. And there's a question. It says, my problem is the, sh uh, the shunt placement was not successful. I have more fluid within and surrounding the brain. Will this therapy help in that area? So again, I'm not sure what the what the goals are with the um, medical team in terms of if there's other things that they can do to try to help with the fluid that is on the brain. Um, sometimes we're a little limited because if that fluid is something that's gonna still sit there and not be able to be managed, um, that is sometimes more of the underlying issue than the cognition impairment in and of itself until they can sort of get that off of the brain to be able to let the brain do what it needs to do. Um, it's it's honestly going to be a little bit more of a challenge. I don't think it hurts to at least, sometimes these evaluations, um, like the other example you gave me, Lakeisha, before this, sometimes it might not be a long course of therapy, but maybe you go in for an evaluation to learn some strategies, or again, to have a caregiver learn some of these strategies, and you're not coming week after week after week. It's more of that educational piece for a session or two, and then you go on your merry way and you just utilize them at home. So, whether or not it's going to, the therapy is going to be helpful. I don't, I don't, it's, it's never going to hurt you, but I don't think you're going to see the same progress solely because um, the, the, the issue of the fluid on the brain just hasn't necessarily been handled. Okay. And also uh, add that if they haven't done the shunt patency test, they should consider looking at that because I can't tell you how many people I've, I've talked to or messaged with who are not seeing results or they are, they're going backwards. They had some improvement and then they're, they're losing ground. And it turns out their shunt is clogged mm -hmm. or it just stopped working. And unfortunately that happens and they have a test called the shunt patency test where they inject dye at the top and then they do a CAT scan and see if it makes it to the abdomen and they can tell if it doesn't, where it stopped, and then take corrective action. Yeah, that's that's true, Trish. And I do, you know, anybody who's having some recurring symptoms or uh, their symptoms are returning, old symptoms or new symptoms, I always, you know, suggest getting their um, 
shunt tested, thoroughly tested. Uh, and so Olivia, I know your strategies uh, focus a lot on, you know, actual um, more on physical is kind of interactive. Mm -hmm. Do you ever recommend there's an individual ask the question about B12? Um, they're, they have a mild case of not NPH. And they're not going forward with the shunt at the time. And they were wondering if B12 would help with cognitive improvement. That would be a better question for the physician. That I'm not 100% sure of. <laughs> I could speak to the cognitive therapy piece, but that I'm not 100% sure of. Okay, yeah. I, I was wondering if that would be something that you can answer. Um, any other questions? Uh, let's see. Uh, I was, uh, when I talked, when Trish talked about the shunt, um, that seemed interesting because the last time I had a shunt malfunction, it was because a stomach virus got into the tubing oh, and Lord. clogged my system. Okay. Thank you, Pedro, for sharing. Yes. It happens. Unfortunately, just proteins in our CSF can clog up the little holes that are in the catheter and stops working. And there's research being done to try and find ways to prevent that. There are coatings, and I'm not an expert at all, but I mean, they don't have a great solution for preventing it yet. Mm -hmm. And the scary part of it was that it didn't show on any of the scans. No. Nope. And the only way that it showed up was because my parents demanded that I get a shunt tap, and that's where they found out. Exactly. I know people say, I've done an x-ray, I've done a CAT scan, I've done a bunch of other scans. And you're right, the, the clog is inside the tube. It doesn't show up unless you do this, some form of shunt patency test. So any other questions on cognitive? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't go in that direction. Yeah. Um, let's see. My memory problems get worse as things around me get busier. Is there any good strategy for dealing with this problem? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I think what we find is that um, as there's more distractors or as there's other things that are happening in the environment around us, it typically affects or taxes our ability to focus and attend to the activity that we're trying to uh, complete. So one of the easy ways is just sort of an environmental change. So if you're in, um, you know, let's say you used to be somebody that could work in an office building and have their door open to the hallway and have music playing in the background. Now that that might be too difficult for you, starting by, you know, shutting off the music, you know, letting people know you're not being rude, but you have to close the door because you really need a little bit more quiet time to yourself are easy ways where you don't have to do a whole lot, but it's just trying to put yourself in a better position where you can limit the background noise or you can limit what's happening around you to try to be um, as focused as possible. Oftentimes people will talk about, you know, when they go to a restaurant, it's really hard for them to be able to sort of focus on the conversation that's happening. So something as simple as maybe picking a table that's sort of in the corner or putting your positioning yourself at the table where the rest of the restaurant is behind you and you're focusing on just the people at your table as opposed to the other way around where there's a lot for you to look at and that can become overwhelming at times. Um, in therapy, we can work on things where, um, you know, you have some strategies to limit that background noise, but then we can also work on activities where we slowly try to reintroduce the background noise. So maybe I put the news radio on while you're trying to read a paragraph. And we see if as your focus gets better, can you sort of start to tune out that news radio and pay more attention to the article that you're reading. So if it's something where you're looking for sort of that quick fix, I think trying to change your environment to, to minimize that busyness or that background noise is, would be the first recommendation. And then if cognitive therapy was something that you would be interested in doing, you know, there's definitely some activities that therapists can work on with you to try to reintroduce and, and work on that focus where you don't get as distracted by what's happening around you. Very good, thank you. Yeah, so that's, that's been a struggle for me, especially since I'm trying to get into the film business, mm -hmm. which is a whole bunch of stuff going around all at once. Mm -hmm. I've been getting a little bit better, but it's still like a struggle. I, I sometimes have someone pass by me with some lights and I'm like, wait, 
<laughs> oh, and then I forgot what I was doing. Yeah. I know when I was working with Trish and we were talking about, um, I think it was your art class maybe and getting ready for your art class. And, you know, we tend to, we tend to want to sort of get back to the way that we were always able to do things and we don't think much about it. So you think about, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to go to work and everything will be fine where maybe you have to take a step back. And I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Trish, but you were forgetting some things in, in, for your different activities. And when we had you say, okay, the night before you're going to sort of gather your thoughts when you don't have a lot going on, you're going to get a book, you're going to get a bag, you're going to keep everything in that bag so that, you know, once, you know, the real world takes back off the next morning, you're already sort of prepared ahead of time. I wound up with five bags. <laughs> class, one for the gym, one for hydrocephalus presentations, et cetera. And it's fine. I mean, I, everybody gives you tote bags, so it didn't cost anything. So I still do it. I have a bag for painting right over there. It's, it helps. Because then when you think of it, you go get whatever the thing is that you want to bring and throw it in the bag. And there's not that mad dash before you're running out the door. Very nice. Very nice. Well, we do thank you so much, Olivia, for your time. If anyone has any last minute questions, um, please say it now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> I just wanted to say, does anyone else have problems with trying to find something and it's staring at you right in the face? And you can't think of the word? No, like you're, let's say you're trying to look for your the ingredients for what like a soup and, you, and the seasoning is right in your face. That happens to me yeah. almost every yeah. single time. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that happens to me. I think I'm just not looking good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I'm going to go ahead and end this um, meeting. We do again. Thank you, Olivia. That was great. And absolutely you for actually hosting it um thank you everyone for joining and you know helping this run smoothly uh, we hope to see you next time for another uh, meeting for the mph population okay and um, thank you again for having me if you guys have questions uh lakeisha or trish you know how to get in touch with me excellent okay right, have a good afternoon everybody bye everyone bye